Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Health Talk. I am your host, Dr. Niru Prasad, with my background, pediatrics emergency medicine, affiliated with Henry Ford Health System, St. Joe, Oakland, and Bowman. The theme of our Health Talk today is very interesting. It is a pulmonary ciliary dyskinesia among children's adolescent and adults. Joining us today as our guest speakers are Dr. Paul Bosick. He is a section head pulmonary department at Bowman Hospital with, who deals with the adult lungs interstitial disease. And uh, another guest speaker is Karen McQueen, and she's a very interesting person. She has a 20-year-old daughter with this, this condition, and she has a lot of experience to tell us about the whole situation. So good morning, Karen. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Good morning, Paul. Thanks good morning, for having Dr. me. Good morning, Dr. Prasad. Give me your introduction first. Paul. What would you like me to say? <laughs> well, I don't know, but but this part I know that it's hard to get hold of you. <laughs> I know. Life is busy, Dr. Prasad, as you well know. Um, but thank you so much. Real honor to be on your thank program. You so and much, yeah. uh, we first met, uh, we got to honor you for your community he gave me award. An award. And then he forgot. He said, What do you look like? I said, <laughs> then he said, It is post COVID. Post COVID brain. <laughs> Okay. So, good morning, Karen, and can you give your introduction? To sure. Um, I'm a mom to two beautiful girls, and we know yeah. we're going to talk about Elena today. Elena's my oldest, and Elena. she's 20 years okay. old. She's a junior at Michigan State University, so go Spartans. And then I have a 13-year-old daughter, Madison. Um, she does not have PCD, and uh, she's in the seventh grade, and just... Being a typical teenager, just typical being a teenager. Yeah, typical teenager, but she is a good kid. So, so it, it's a lot of effort, you know, raising three daughters, isn't it? Yes, yes, they keep me on my toes, absolutely. They keep yep. you on the toe, yeah. So we are going to talk about uh, this this pulmonary ciliary dyskinesia. And I, I, I tell you, it, is, it wasn't easy for me because we don't see those things very often. Right? Correct. So then I started making some slides, and uh, Paul will correct me if I am wrong. The basic anatomy lies in those cilia, that uh, that uh, you know lines the the trachea tra and the airway. So what happens? You know, these cilia they get they get they are not functioning. So any food particles, anything particles, you know, the person is unable to unable you know to pass through without. So that's what the mucus gets stuck and most important thing is you know it is affecting the ear, airway and the lungs. So do you yeah. agree with me or do you have anything else to yeah, add no, before we do the next slide? Absolutely right Dr. Prasad. So um, let's just go back to what this, this condition is called. It's right. primary ciliary dyskinesia, right? So three things here. So primary means something secondary didn't cause it. Right. It comes yeah. from the body's own kind of genetic composition, mm -hmm. right? And so this is an inherited condition. Okay. It's what we call a recessive condition, meaning each parent contributed to the condition. Yeah. Um, and, and ciliary, you know, refers to those hair-like structures that you talk about that are throughout different places yeah. in the body. There are types of what we call in science microtubules mm -hmm. that usually have a rhythmic beat to them, right? Hair-like structures, as you mentioned. Right. And yeah. these things can beat, you know, m dozens of times a second to help conduct a certain movement of something in the right. body. And that can happen in many different cases, uh, many different areas of the body, many different mm -hmm. systems in the body like the eustachian tube of the ear, for yeah. instance. And you mentioned the respiratory tract. And that goes from the sinuses all the way out to the periphery of the lungs, lungs right? Yes. And it can yeah. be seen in other uh, areas, too. Interestingly, interestingly, those microtubules also 
are responsible for the correct positioning mm. of certain organs during embryonic development. Okay. So some folks with this condition may have um, organs that might be on the opposite side of the body than one might expect or in a different place. Yeah, the situs inverse. The situs I, wrote, I read about that yeah, too. It's yeah. really fascinating. And then the dyskinesia is the third word in, in mm -hmm. the condition. And movement disorder, right? Right. It's a disorder, <laughs> a disorder of movement. And so to different degrees and variable ways, mm -hmm. the, the hair-like structures are either not moving or they're moving against mm -hmm. one another or they're just not moving as strong as one would expect. Oh. So you put all those together and, and those comprise many of the conditions um, and potential complications of the condition that you see on the slide in front right. of you here, yeah, from yeah. the sinuses to the, the ears to the airways to the show more lower lungs. How they affect. But uh, in, in other words, from what I found out from my studies, it's an autosomal recessive, right? Mm -hmm. If one parent has it, there is a 25% chance if both parents have the gene, it is 50%. Am I right? Yeah. Yep, if you make the little Punnett squares that we all did back in the day in right, high school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, Karen, you, told, you tell me, you, you, saw, you share your experiences with her. How was, as a baby and during early childhood, mm -hmm. how did you handle and what were the symptoms? Well, I always say Elena was sick from the get-go. When she was born, she didn't cry at first. Oh, she, she coughed. Okay. That was her very first sound, mm -hmm. was a cough. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought, uh-oh, there's something wrong. And of course, everyone's like, you're just tired. She's OK. They were listening to her lungs. Her lungs were a little chunky and junky. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, it's probably from the amniotic fluid. She'll be fine. OK. A um, couple days went by. We were discharged from the hospital, went to see the pediatric uh, sorry, the pediatrician, I think it was maybe 72 hours after she was born, and um, they sent me for her very first chest x-ray, oh, um, wow. which was going to be one of many. Okay. Um, her lungs, she was wheezing. That uh, was pediatrics, right? Pediatrics, pediatrics. Yeah. They are the one who sent you. Okay. Right. So that, that was the start of our journey. Um, mm -hmm. And then within a few weeks, she had her first case of bronchitis, um, had our first breathing treatment, nebulizer, um, lots of uh, blood work being done, mm -hmm. um, and just going down this path. And it took us actually four years uh, for her to receive a diagnosis. Four years. It took us four years until she was diagnosed. Her symptoms, many, many ear infections, repeat uh, bronchitis, pneumonia, sinus yeah. infections. Bronchitis, yeah. Yeah, everything that we had just spoke of, she checked all of those boxes. She had all of that. And since PCD is so rare, it wasn't really on anyone's radar. I know, uh, we were looking rare. for a lot of other things. And as we, as you had mentioned, with the cilia moving the internal organs, mm -hmm. one, before Elena was diagnosed with PCD, she was diagnosed with a laryngeal cleft. And we didn't think that that had any correlation. We just thought, wow, we have really okay. bad luck here. Mm -hmm. But with learning more about PCD, we think that because she has PCD, that her larynx did not form correctly. Okay. So, so Paul, tell us, is it how rare? I hear it is a very rare. It thing, is right. It is. It's a rare it took condition. Me a long time to figure out about this when I went through the literatures. Yeah, yeah it's a rare condition, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I'm sure though. I'm sure of this. I'm sure it's under recognized because right. of the complexity, because mm -hmm. of how difficult, and I'm sure we can talk about that during the show and Elena's journey through her diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably under-recognized. And one of the things, one of the take-home messages, if people have this concern at home for your audience, is they really got to go to a center that knows what they're doing to try what to understand right. this, yeah. because there's very right. specific diagnostic criteria, right. and it usually, and none of them are perfect, so they need to be used together. So you need a good center with a great healthcare team right. that can bring all these resources to bear for the person. Right. Where, where did you take her to? You must have in, visited a lot of institutions. Oh, we went to a lot of hospitals. <laughs> we went We went to a lot of doctors. Um, and in the end, we um, traveled out of state. 
Uh, we traveled to Boston Children's Hospital oh, where they scoped her. That is supposed her. to be very good. Yes, they were amazing there, and they ended up diagnosing her with a laryngeal cleft. Oh. And so that was one of her first diagnoses, oh, and they thought, cleft. Okay. and they thought that that was the answer to all of her ailments. Um, I had an appointment with uh, the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. They oh. um, are the leaders in PCD research. And I kept that appointment because mother's intuition, I just felt deep down inside that, right, yep. you know, we need to keep this appointment because mm. I still, I just had a feeling she had it. Um, and then she was diagnosed um, with PCD from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Oh, they were okay, able so to do the biopsies and they had all the equipment and everything so down there. A lot of articles have been have been written from the from the that Carolina hospital and I have yes. included it all in the bibliography. So mm -hmm. they are the one who made a diagnosis for you. And that was Correct. what age? Um, she was four years old. Four years. Yeah, so. she was four years old. Yes. Okay. Yes. So after that how did she how did she function for you? I mean the rest. It, it's been a roller coaster ride. Um, mm -hmm. She's treated like a cystic fibrosis patient. Right. We yeah, use a lot of the same medicines. Yeah. That, yeah. A lot of breathing treatments through the nebulizer, a mm -hmm. lot of inhalers. Um, for a while, she did the vest therapy uh, to help loosen the mucus in her lungs. Um, a lot of bronchoscopies, oh, a okay. lot of hospitalizations, mm -hmm. a lot of IV treatments. Um, so yeah, it's a very similar treatment plan as the cystic fibrosis, but the mutation and the underlying disease are very right, different. Yeah. Very close to Paul, what do you have to add? I know cystic fibrosis, my experience working in children's hospital, I used to see so many patients, you know, with the cystic fibrosis, how they suffered all bronchiolitis, pneumonia and this and that. So what do you have to say? Do you have anything to add to this? If what should be the treatment, like since it is like cystic fibrosis? Sure. Well, let's let's back up just a second and talk about what some of the medical complications right yeah PCD complications can cause. of cystic fibrosis. Right. So when the cilia is not beating normally. Um, one of the most prominent features of it is the effects on the lungs. Lungs. Right. So normal functioning cilia, there's a mucociliary elevator, what we call it, right, yeah. that helps us all move secretions that we normally produce up through the lungs and we clear our throats or cough out phlegm from time to time. And, and that's the body's natural way of expelling that. In, in, in PCD, that doesn't happen. That mucociliary elevator doesn't go to the top. No, and no, sometimes it, it doesn't go the, anywhere, yeah, yeah. which means that that it phlegm, those stuck. secretions, yeah. are going to stay in the lungs. And, and since the lungs are open to the air, mm. right, any okay. bacteria, any virus, anything that gets in, mm. usually it's supposed to get trapped by that phlegm so we can get it out. Right. And yeah. that cilia helps us. Yeah. But in conditions like PCD, that doesn't happen. So that bacteria can stay down there. So one of the uh, most frequent complications infection. is frequent infection. Yeah, yeah. that can bronchitis. recur and recur. Bronchitis in, in bigger airways, bronchiolitis in smaller airways. That bronchiolitis is actually sometimes presenting very similar to asthma. Yes. Right. So it's yeah. it's very confusing early in the course of the workup. Yes. Is it bronchiolitis related to asthma, or there's pediatric bronchiolitis that never evolves into asthma, or something else? Correct. Yes. Did you guys have that experience? Yes. It was, that asthma experience? was the first experience. Was asthma. the first diagnosis mm -hmm. was asthma, and then they thought, well, maybe it was food allergy, yeah. um, and then we went down the cystic fibrosis route, um, and then the fistula route, um, the cleft. I mean, PCD was kind of the last one to come to the table. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know, working at emergency room, and I did see a lot of kids who comes with the bronchiolitis. Also with the cystic sure. fibrosis, but not a, I could never even think about something like this. My gross diagnosis, baby with cystic fibrosis. Yeah. And that's how, that's Super the way, you know, Correct. we treated them. So. Right. 
So, so you had this other you had this other diagram, I think, Dr. Prasad, that showed yeah, some different no. changes through life uh, related yeah. to what yeah. can occur with PCD that might be interesting for your viewers. So this is the yeah, this is the diagram we are talking about, right? Mm -hmm. They have it on my slide presentation. And I can so the, during the infant time they have present with the situs inverses, yes. right. neonatal distress. Nasal obstruction during the childhood, again, chronic cough, otitis media, rhinos, and pneumonia and bronchitis. And it's that bronchiectasis that I want to talk about and yeah, come back no, to for yeah, just a right. second. Because, <clears throat> because you are, you are a specialized specialist yeah. in interstitial lung disease. And, so. and, and bronchiectasis is, is a complicated word, but really what it boils down to is that the airways are bigger than they ought to be. Yeah. So what happens is after repeated infection, repeated bouts of inflammation, the the airway kind of loses that natural elasticity to keep it the correct size. Yeah. And so then it starts to uh, grow to a larger diameter than it ought be. Right. And, and and this is a gross analogy, but it, it gets the point across. If you shoot a spitball with a McDonald's straw, that thing's going to go. That phlegm will come that up. Will come. If you put that spitball in a two-inch PVC pipe and try right. to blow, <laughs> it ain't going anywhere. Right. Right. So it complicates the already underlying challenges yeah. with secretion mobilization right. um, that we see in PCD. And I just wanted to say all that before we talked about therapies because, right. yeah. you know, at the forefront of everything mm -hmm. is secretion clearance. Secretion, how do we yes. get that phlegm up? How do we get the potential yeah. bacteria that's living down there up? You know, and then what do we do to How provide we, secondary support? And I bet right. Elena's gone through a lot of that. Do you have right. anything to add to this? Right. Well, doctors? Elena, I, the mucus just sits in her nose. It sits in her ears. It just sits in her lungs. I mean, I can't. I lost count of how many ear tubes she had. She probably had at yeah, least 12 to 14 sets of ear tubes. Because media, sinusitis, and lungs. Open. Right, just to help get that mucus and all of those secretions out. I mean, and to this day, she's 20 years old. She has coughed and wheezed every single day of her life. Every day. Her lungs have never been clear. Oh, there has okay. never been a time that they're clear, even after she has a bronchoscopy, and that's mm -hmm. where they um, she goes under anesthesia and they put a tube down into her lungs and they clear out the secretions. Mm -hmm. Even getting as much out as they can, she still always has that wheeze and Only that cough. That. Okay. Yeah. Would you comment about the diagnosis, different ways of diagnosing this before we yeah. go to the Treatment. Yeah, so so it, it's very complicated. Lab and, 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 and electron and, microscope. Sure, and, yeah. and it uses um, diagnostics that are not common, right? So it's more than just a breathing test. There are right. breathing problems, and breathing. someone gets a breathing test, and we say, that looks like asthma. But wait, you know, right. the, 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 the walk is not done yet. We have to go further. So it takes a high degree of what's called clinical suspicion, mm -hmm. Yes. Right, it, 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 we've got a list of possibilities, mm -hmm. and this is on the list. And if we believe it to be the diagnosis, then we really need to find that specialized team, mm -hmm. right? Right, like you did for Elena, mm -hmm. um, to help make that diagnosis because um, it requires a couple different things. Um, there's genetic testing that's available, and you yeah. can look to see what specific genes may not be functioning properly. Right. Now, there's like 250 plus genes in those microtubules exactly. of about exactly. 40 to 50 so many genes. implicated. Always a mutation, right? right? Yes. 40 to 50 yeah. are most implicated mm -hmm. with PCD, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, and and so that's good if you get a hit, but it's not the end of it because there are so many genes. Is that the one? Is that the cause? Correct. Yes. So then there's other things like they can take biopsy and they can put it under. Um, electron microscopy mm -hmm. to see if they can look at the microtubule, the cilia, right. to see if it functionally looks the way it should be. This is not an easy exam to get done routinely, right? Okay. There's yeah. Right, and it involves biopsy. There's other mm -hmm. biopsy where they actually, under light microscopy, look to see the beading pattern right. of the cilia. Um, and, and none of these on their own Nothing are really. diagnostic. Right. So it takes a combination of these tests together that point you in the direction of this diagnosis along with the clinical picture that picture. fits. Right, right, 
Right, and when we went through it, so that was 16 years ago okay. when Elena was um, being tested mm. and trying to get a diagnosis, and that's what they did. They did a biopsy sample okay. from her uh, from her Sinusis. nose, yeah, yeah to try nose. to get oh, okay. to see if that cilia would be. And you have to go up pretty high up there to get that. So getting the biopsy, which we learned was very important because yeah. we tried it a couple times and they didn't get a good sample of the biopsy, and she mm. had to do it again. And also, when she was diagnosed back 16 years ago, there weren't any mutations. Uh, we went ahead and we did the blood work and we put her in the study. And since then, in the past 16 years, they've come up, I think they now have 44 mutations from PCD. Yeah. So uh, there is progress with the research on the disease. There's a lot more to do. Um, I feel that we were fortunate because they did find one of they did find her mutation. Oh, they did. So they find did find the her mutation. So right. now they are targeting that, right? Right, right. So now, right, the mutations that they have found, right, they're looking to how to treat the disease. I mean, I don't know how to grow the cilia, how to get mm. the cilia moving, because that's the that's the baseline of the disease yeah. is getting the cilia moving and, and cilia growing. Cilia is not moving. Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. So can you comment now about the, you know, the treatment protocols? Like she says, so many episodes of bronchitis, pneumonia, yeah. bronchitis. Disease. So what are the antibiotics or uh, what are the antibiotics to you will recommend as a pulmonologist? Yeah, wow. And, and that's a tricky one because there's a lot of bacteria out there in the world and they seem <laughs> I, to find I, our, I, yeah. you know, primary cilia dyskinesia patients, yes. which is very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that it sounds like Elena's doctors have done is, is try to keep an eye on it through frequent surveillance of the type of phlegm that mm -hmm. she makes and mm -hmm. they probably send it for cultures periodically yes. mm -hmm. and yes. they say are we growing certain types of bacteria and then and then ideally you target the specific bacteria you don't want to provide right. yeah, bigger antibiotics than you need right. but you certainly can't make the antibiotics not big enough right. to cover yeah. that particular bug and they can change the type of infection can change yes. from one mm -hmm. sample to another sample right. causing people to need to change antibiotics so antibiotics is important in PCD because but, infection yeah. the pneumonias the exacerbations of the bronchiectasis the flares right. of that inflammation mm -hmm. and infection are unfortunately pretty common. Yeah, so but when I was doing all these research studies, I read about that uh, the respiratory function test. Can you comment on that? Because I could not, uh, I could not <clears throat> comprehend myself. You know, this is not my specialty. Yeah. So I want to know from the specialist, yeah. Sure, you. And, and, and this is something that probably more people at home can relate to than, than PCD, thank goodness, exactly. but lots of folks have had breathing tests before, yeah, right? right, And, yeah. and uh, the most common breathing test that's done is called spirometry. And, right? and that we do for the asthmatics too. And right? you can do it yeah. for the asthmatics too, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, and for smoking-related lung diseases and others. And the idea is, you know, there's a there's a tube that's attached to equipment that measures how forcefully mm -hmm. someone can blow out hard and fast oh, okay. from absolutely full lungs to absolutely emptying their lungs. So we ask mm -hmm. them to do that as hard and as fast as we can. Right. If there's if there's something that's resisting someone from exhaling quickly, and that could be small airways that are constricted because of inflammation, or that could be secretions that are in the airway that make it hard to exhale, then, then it takes longer for longer people to get that breath out. And so then we say, well, that's, there's some obstruction, there's some obstructive lung condition going on, and then that opens up you know, a bunch of different possibilities. Right. And in most times in pediatrics, it's asthma or it's bronchiolitis. Right. Asthma, asthma or bronchiolitis. Right. Asthma or bronchiolitis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Different allergy, asthma or something. One thing I wanted to ask you, one test somewhere I read, I don't even remember, nitrous oxide oh, level yeah. is low. Can you comment yeah. on that? So, right. That is from the nasal 
It, it, it is. I wrote and, it down someplace. And no. I don't know, and Karen, maybe you know, but Goodness I don't Christmas. know that anyone knows exactly why the cilia actually, normally beating cilia actually produce nitric oxide. Nitrous oxide, and, yeah. And right. um, when they're not functioning properly, there is a statistically significant uh, decrease in the amount of yeah, yeah. Uh, nitric oxide production. Yeah. And so that can be sampled, and that's another screening test. Right. Um, and that's one of those things that I don't think we know why it's different, but it is. It's, it's without a question, different in, in kids with PCD. Right, yeah. I'm, I haven't heard of, of have any been. research of why that is, but I know yeah. that is one of the tests yeah. to help the diagnose with PCD. Nitrous oxide measurement to detect the level of nitric oxide right when you breathe out and this level is low in the persons with the PCT. right know. right but the chest ct is that more diagnostic ct scan of the chest yeah so what imaging just um like poor elena had her first chest x-ray on day three <laughs> um chest imaging is important for uh understanding yeah. symptoms that someone right. might be having yeah. right so chest x-rays screening is a screening imaging study if we need more specific information about what we're seeing on the chest x-ray a ct scan can be obtained which gives much more detailed anatomic information mm -hmm. and um Oftentimes, Elena's had those scopes, those bronchoscopies scopes, that right, go. Yeah. So it's not uncommon for a pulmonologist to use the CT scan to say, aha, this is where I want to go. This right. is where I need my sample. This right. is the area of the airway that's blocked that we need to take the phlegm from. Okay, yeah. so this is what it is. And what are the long-term effects? This is a question from her. What are the long-term effects on respiratory health? For the individuals with PCD. Yeah. Well, do, do you mind if we actually like hear what Elena's path has been so far, and then yeah, maybe yeah, we can yeah, talk sure, about. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Well, I know we had talked about. Um, this was know, the question, so that's why you know. Yeah. Right. Doing the breathing tests and everything. So mm -hmm. um, again, I mentioned before over the years with the chronic ear infections, um, mm -hmm. Elena has pretty much lost her hearing because of the chronic infections from PCD. And same thing with her lung function. On a good day, her lung function's only in the 50% range. And that's oh. not ever gonna go any higher. Um, okay. When she's sick, it will go into the 40% 40 40%. range. 40%. Yeah, and that's yeah. all from years and years of pneumonia and bronchitis and just the constant infections. And I mean, just every day you can just hear it in her lungs. She just constantly has mucus oh. and bacteria in her lungs. Um, so that's, one thing that I'm always concerned about with, you know, as she's getting older, right? Right, what are, right. What's, yeah, right, what, older. what is the progression of the de disease going to be like as she gets older? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's 20 now, she'll be 21 in August, and oh, okay. just wondering, you know, what the trajectory will look like as she ages. Yeah, and, and, and you know, everyone's different, right? right? There's a spectrum of this disease from right. mild. It's Some spectrum. people aren't even diagnosed until mm -hmm. adulthood with Correct. very minimal, if any, other uh, signs or symptoms of the condition mm -hmm. um, to the other end of the spectrum where there's you know, frequent and multiple issues caused by the PCD, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the challenge for something like PCD is that it's something that we provide what we call supportive care for, right? Supportive care. In other, in other right, words, yeah. there's not a medicine mm -hmm. that can help reverse the underlying condition. Right. Right. Now, um, we've had some breakthroughs in cystic fibrosis with medications. Mm -hmm. The hope is on the horizon that there could be more things like that for other conditions like PCD. Right. Um, but right now, the best we have is that good supportive care. Supportive mm -hmm. and care, yeah. And of course, that means that we could still have pneumonias. We could still have right. exacerbations of the bronchiectasis. Right. Each time we have one of those, it's exposure to a different antibiotic. There's the possibility for resistance patterns. Correct. And that can make for future challenges, no question. Mm. Um, sounds like Elena's getting amazing supportive care from her healthcare amazing. team, which yes, is yeah. which is outstanding. And I'm sure she's quite yeah. the hero <laughs> herself for keeping up with it all, because it's not easy. It's, it's not, not easy, easy as a patient. Easy. It's taxing it's physically, mentally, I'm sure, emotionally. I know. It's, it's got to be very hard. It's a full-time job. It I mean, her disease job. is yeah, a full-time full job. job. I mean, yeah. she... Yeah. 
miss fifty percent of school years because she was sick all the time. I mean, we had to have you know private tutors to help her with her schooling. You know, she missed out on field trips. She just she missed out on a lot of things. But with her, I've always said, well, let's focus on what we haven't missed out. Let's right. focus on yeah, what, what we can, we can do, do and where you're headed. I mean, never in a million years did I think that she would be able to live on her own and mm-hmm. go to college. I mean, when she was a baby and when she was so sick, she didn't go to preschool because she was but so sick. But you did I, a wonderful job raising absolutely. her. Absolutely. Know, Congratulations. She's you. She's, so you did a lot of credit. It goes to the... Oh, thank you. Yeah, to you. And supportive care, that is very important, yes. how to put up this. and very. Yeah, I was trying to get hold of uh, some, you know, psychologist or something, but I couldn't. But next time, okay, bet- between me and him, we will find somebody sub- to support. Dr. Prasad and I were talking last night just in general about, yeah, you know, social, cr- yeah. chronic issues in general, especially yes. in, you know, uh, someone yeah, Elena's yeah, age or younger, is, right. is hard on a person, it's hard yes. on her, it's hard yes. on all the caretakers, there's an emotional, it's you know, taxing that goes correct. on with it, so, yeah, just, I mean... Yeah. It's amazing, uh, and her ability to do what she's doing reflects on, you know, all of your courage. All of oh, you, all you. support. So, so I like to thank you for coming to my show today. Time is running by. I like to thank you for sharing your stories. I like to thank the specialist, Dr. Posick, for coming to my show. Give us, and then what I was thinking, you know, we will go into more detail about find the right social worker, somebody yes. who can help you, you know, deal with the situation. It's very torturous, isn't it? It's- it's a very tortured mm-hmm. thing, you know, to see your loved ones with suffering, especially your children, right? Especially. So I like to thank our producer, our camera people for helping me produce this show. And until I saw, see you guys again, have a safe and a wonderful spring and summer. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank thank you Dr. Okay.